Sejam bem-vindos. Hoje é o terceiro dia do festival. O Relanteio é um festival internacional literário Relâmpago, que reúne autorias internacionais da fantasia, ficção científica e horror em debates ao vivo e gratuitos transmitidos pelo YouTube. Então, inscreva-se no nosso canal e apoie para que o Relanteio possa continuar nos próximos anos. O link do PayPal e do Pix está fixo na nossa descrição abaixo. Neste ano, com o valor arrecadado, iremos apoiar o projeto Tem Gente com Fome, no endereço www.temgenteconfome.com.br. Também gostaríamos de lembrar que estamos realizando sorteios de livros. Nós vamos divulgar o link do formulário no chat, então não perca a chance de participar. Bom, recados dados. Estamos com Nise Shawn, dos Estados Unidos, Ana, Ma Ana Meira e Cintia Oliveira. O tema da nossa mesa hoje será utopias e distopias. Iremos traduzir ao vivo a mesa pelo nosso chat. Hoje quem vai estar traduzindo são Cali de Los Santos e Luísa Cantoni. Muito obrigada. E Ana Rush está aqui no backstage com a gente. Obrigada, Ana. Porém, queremos pedir a colaboração de todos, pois para acompanhar a tradução no chat, ele precisa rodar um pouco devagar. Então, para mandar perguntas, escreva a palavra pergunta antes para que seja possível identificar. Now, I'll switch to English. Welcome, everyone. Today is the third day of the Relampeio, an international literary festival that brings together international authors of fantasy, science fiction, and horror in live and free debates on YouTube. So, subscribe to our channel and support it so that Helen Payo can continue in the years to come. The PayPal link is fixed in your description below. First, we are very grateful to you for accepting your invitation to be here in the Helen Payo Festival. Thank you. We are with the authors Nisi Chão from the US and Ana Meira and Cintia Oliveira from Brazil. The main theme of this panel will be dystopia and utopia. And before we begin, I will describe myself physically, and after that, I will ask all participants and guests to do the same and also introduce themselves. Okay, my name is Mayara Barbosa. My pronouns is she, her. I'm a black woman with black short curly hair. I'm wearing black glasses. I have black eyes. I'm wearing a white t-shirt with some drawn, drawings from the artist Basquiat. I'm wearing a silver earring. And behind me, there is a white wall. Now, Nisi Shaw, can you introduce and describe physically yourself, please? Sure. Uh, Nisi Shaw, uh, pronouns they, them. I am an African-American woman, a black woman, um, but I am uh, gender fluid, so this may change at any moment. <laughs> I am uh, wearing a brown overshirt and a green undershirt and uh, a beaded necklace, brown beads and glasses. Thank you, Nisi. Oh, should I say my background? Um, yeah. There's, there's quite a bit behind me, um, including bookcases, my loft bed, uh, and my ancestor shrine with a candle burning. Thank you, Nisi. Uh, and Amira, can you do the same? Yes. Thank you, Mayara. Thank you, Nisi, Cynthia. I love my name in English. 
<laughs> so I'm Ana Meira, and I'm a translator, a writer. I work also with education. I love science fiction, fantasy, and well, anything I find interesting. <laughs> um, I'm a young black woman. I have brown eyes. I have curly brown hair up to my shoulders. I have a big smile, I guess. <laughs> and I'm wearing a kind of brown, red lipstick. I'm also wearing glasses today. And I'm wearing white blouse. Behind me, there's a kind of a bookshelf. Uh, I'm actually in an office that isn't mine, so these books aren't mine. I cannot tell <laughs> them, uh, you about them. So I guess that's it. Thank you, Anna. Cynthia, your time. Okay. Let's do this. Um, hi, guys, or um, Very honored to be here. Thank you, Mayara. Thank you, Anna, DC. And I'm Cynthia. I'm a writer. I'm a book editor and a literature student. I'm a black, non binary person. My pronouns are they, them. Uh, I have short, curly hair, and I'm wearing a red, blue plaid shirt. Uh, I'm in a clean, small room, and there's a wardrobe, small wardrobe behind me, and that's it. Is that everything, right? Yeah, thanks to be here, Cynthia. So, can we start the conversation, Anna? Yeah, I was going to start with a question from the script, but Nisia was telling about the candle for your ancestors, right? And how it's important for your writing. I was wondering if we could start with you. You're telling this to us in the backstage and I, it really touched me. I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about it. Well, um, <clears throat> I practice something called Ifa, which is a uh, West African based tradition, which is related to uh, traditions throughout the world, uh, including uh, Candomblé and Santeria. And um, I always pray before I start writing that I will have help and inspiration and guidance from my ancestors and also from Eshu, because uh, Eshu is the one who is at the crossroads and who puts the, the dreams and the imagination into speech. And then sometimes um, my writing will be about particular figures in um, my religion. So that's, that's part of it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that's so beautiful, amazing. actually. Actually, Exu also is really a big entity also here in Brazil. In Candomblé is from Brazil, also yeah. in Banda. Yeah. African Brazilian uh, religions. Yes. It's amazing that you know them. Oh, um, I study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm actually now I'm going to start uh, telling a story to, to enter our topic. Is utopia and dystopia. Um, when I was around 13 years old, it was the first time I heard the word, word utopia. I was in school and the teacher asked us to watch you know, Lord of the Flies <laughs> and then think about a society that started up from zero in an island. And me and my group were just children, but we thought about a new society and everyone got along with each other and everything was great and we didn't have prisons. It, it was awesome. <laughs> and when I told our teacher about it, she looked me in the eyes and said, well, that can be true. So we have to redo it. And I was, oh, oh why? Well, what you're describing is a utopia. So you cannot do this kind of society because you have to imagine that humans are going to kill each other, or they need prisons and stuff like this. And that, at the time, it kind of crushed me. I think that's why I still remember the story. So what I want to, to ask first uh, is, do you remember the time that you first heard the word utopia or thought about this idea or a story, a utopian story? 
So I was thinking about this. Um, I came to the understanding the term utopia quite late. Uh, I was in college. Uh, I was, by the way, I, I fully admit that I was a hippie. I was in college at the time that that uh, the the hippie movement was was widespread and and um, the term came to me as a descriptor of Ecotopia, which was a book by Ernest Kallenbach about how people could coexist with nature. Um, earlier, I had also read Lord of the Flies, and it seemed to me a false narrative. Uh, because it was, um, I rejected it as I read it. Uh, it was uh, all about uh, people being horrible and violent to each other. And I've since learned that that uh, narrative was based on an actual occurrence that did not go in that manner. That, that um, it was based on... Um, people actually, children actually being um, stranded on an island and they did not murder one another and, and resort to cannibalism and everything. Um, that uh, the author changed the facts to make it uh, to what he felt was a better story. No, no, it's not a better story. It's, it's a wrong and um, completely false story. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that actually. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, Cynthia, sorry, you can do your question. No, you, you said about um, ecotopia. I, the first time I, I heard the the concept, actually not the word, but like the, learned the concept of utopia. It was in high school, but it was like in a philosophy class, and I didn't really pay much attention to to that. And I didn't. I don't know. I didn't really. It didn't really echo in me the, the the concept of utopia. So I actually start thinking about uh, utopias and dystopias uh, when I start reading for real science fiction and speculative fictions. But you said you you, you said you use the term ecotopia. Uh, can you talk more about it? Because one of my questions actually related to that. Uh, uh, it's it's the title of a book, Ecotopia, um, mm -hmm. and it is uh, a piece of fiction written by someone who was trying who had the agenda of um trying to bring people uh into a utopian uh format they he wanted people to become utopians and and to start utopian societies i also um around the same time became familiar with uh real life utopian attempts um, such as uh, there was a community, I think, in Virginia in the eastern United States called Twin Oaks. Um, so uh, that, was, that was an instance of people trying to live uh, by utopian principles. And um, as I learned more about these things, I learned that there, these attempts were almost always failures. Mm. I'm typing the name of the uh, the book e Ecotopia into the chat so that you can see the author's name and how the spelling and all that. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I, I I can follow with my my questions or yeah, I'll I'll make my question then. Okay, actually, my first question for you, Nisi, uh, it has two parts. Uh, but I think, I don't know, thinking about utopias and dystopia seems really important to me in this specific uh, moment of historical moment of time, uh, what we're living now, uh, pandemic. So, yeah, the, the year is 2021. I mean, we thought we would have robots and <laughs> flying cars and going to Mars and colonizing Mars. Uh, but we're living a pandemic now for over a year. And during this year, besides the pandemic, we have uh, a global economic sanitary earthquake uh, on top of all race, gender, class, inequality, climate change, 
uh, democratic instability of the last decades. So I don't know for you guys, I, I feel like I'm living the beginning of a, a dystopian novel and I read and I edit dystopian novels. And so I got, a, I got a sense, I feel like we all have a sense of how things can go downhill. I feel we're living at dystopia. So my first question, like the first part of my question, uh, do you think, Nessie, it's possible to think an utopia in the 21st century, or in the moment we're living now, uh, considering everything that's been going on? Or, and how important do you think it is uh, to discuss and imagine an utopia and what kind of utopia should we discuss? When I think about utopias and dystopias in general, I come back to uh, something that Octavia Butler said, actually. Um, she said uh, that a utopia for one person would be a dystopia for someone else. Um, and this I, th I find um, pretty much true across the board, whatever sort of model or template people are using for their um, for their their utopia, um, because we are really quite different, uh, all of us, um, in our backgrounds, in our physical beings. Um, so, so what works very well for some people will not work very well for everyone. Um, and and she really understood that. So, is it possible to think about? Uh, utopianism in this this point yes i think so uh, and i think that um our dreaming and imaginations and philosophy and planning are the most important part of a utopia that its realization is always going to be um incomplete which is one of the things i <clears throat> excuse me, was trying to get at with Everfair, that it is the process of building a utopia that is what we really need rather than the achievement. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, actually I was <laughs> going to ask about Everfair, that you write about a land that is safe for people of Congo and other are running from slavery during colonial times. So is Everfair, so is Everfair actually a utopia? It, it, it does it come in this idea of perspective. Is, is, it, is, is it a utopia just for uh, people running, people in this situation? How does this work in colonial times? So in Everter, Everfair, what I have is, um, it actually plays out that several different ideas of utopia are in play and uh, they're conflicting ideas. And uh, the, you know, um, the Christian missionaries from the US want one sort of society. Um, the European socialists envision another and the uh, people who are indigenous to the area who leave and then come back uh, have another. Um, and, and so um, it's a conversation uh, and not always a friendly conversation between these different versions of utopia. So um, that is what Everfair is, not one utopia, but, um, the interplay of many utopias. And yeah, of course, uh, I was gonna say, and of course there's the dystopia, which is, you know, the situation with uh, people being slain by the millions um, and, and maimed and um, forced into labor that uh, was going on prior to this, these impositions of the different utopias. Yeah, so uh, it's also utopias and dystopias coexisting and how do they relate to each other? I think, how, how do utopias and dystopias relate to each other? 
how do they relate to each other? Um, they they um, are really opposed to one another, um, okay. I, I believe. But again, I come back to the idea that a utopia for one person is a dystopia for another. Uh, so arguably, um, Leopold's uh, version of the Congo in, in Everfair or prior to Everfair is a utopia for him. You know, it's like, bring on the wealth. This is what I want. Um, but it, for, for everyone else, it's, it's hugely dystopic. Um, it's the disruption of their lives, um, the destruction of their uh, families. It, it's, um, it's bad. Um, so uh, I would say that philosophically, um, the ideas are opposed. And in reality, they, they come from, from um, one another. Yeah, uh, and also like about Everfair, I think there's this really interesting idea that we were talking before that remind us of the idea of Quilombo that yeah. we, have, we have here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So here in Brazil, Quilombos practically emerged during colonial times as a form of resistance and shelter for black people. One of the most known Quilombo was Quilombo dos Palmares, and it it had almost like over 30,000 people. 30,000 people, yeah. And a great researcher, Beatriz Nascimento, says Quilombos were a place that where black people could see and exist as human beings. And these Quilombos go through time until today. And we have also urban Quilombos, uh, fantasy stories uh, from Brazil Brazilian authors like Marcelo Bissolete. Yeah, I was thinking, in Everfair, did you have any inspirations in Black resistance places like this? Did you uh, research? Uh, you told us before that you found also utopian communities happening right now and nowadays. So, You know, I wish I had been able to, but I did not. Um, the, the only example of this sort of thing actually in the U.S. that I know of is um, the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, there, there were communities um, within the swamp using the landscape as protection. Um, but no, I was unable to um, research that and I did not uh, look into the, the communities that you're talking about, the Quilombos. Um, other, other writers have, um, Nalo Hopkinson, for instance, um, her next novel is pretty much set in uh, a Caribbean version. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, but, yeah, me too. <laughs> um, what, um, one of the inspirations for Everfair, again, was... Um, Henry Ford. Henry Ford had um, a pretty much a company town where in, um, I believe it was in Brazil, where uh, he had like, it's an Amazon, yeah. and he had the uh, factories and everything. And, and um, I thought, well, that was probably his version of utopia. Yeah, because of the rubber trees, right? Exactly. You get the rubber exactly. for the cars, and yeah, this is very, yeah. very crazy, right? Yeah. The and middle so of the Amazon. I wanted to, exactly. So I wanted to um, subvert that idea. That's yeah. all I used. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I was uh, I'm like itching to ask you, Missy, because you're always. We were talking about like how a utopia for someone is a, can be a dystopian for another person. So what is utopia? What is your utopia? Can what would mine be like? Yeah, what it would be like. I, I'm itching to ask you that. <laughs> oh, um, it would be very much um, focused on families and uh, families of choice as well as families of birth. Um, 
there would be um, lots and lots of not necessarily separated by space, but um, separated by um, a, a, a form of kinship. There would be uh, groups of probably no more than 50 people um, that would, would form uh, political units um, and they might actually all live, you know, within blocks of one another, but they would um, they would depend on one another. Um, they would depend within their group on one another for their sustenance and for their care. Um, I would see um, two kinds of divisions within that family group: one based on age, as in you know, all of the people that are in my age group, I have a certain affinity with, I have certain duties that I perform with a certain, um, certain pleasures that I take with them. And I would also see um, a division based on, oh, um, on affinities, I guess. Um, there would be like a group within that would be focused on making music, for example, and another group that would be focused on um, medicine and and so forth and so on. And then the, these smaller groups would um, would meet together uh, in larger groups and also would would um, connect with one another through individuals. And that's as far as I get with it. Um, well, you gave a lot of thought. I, mean, <laughs> I have no idea. Did you ask me that question? I have no idea. I don't know that's... if you. If, I don't know if you. You gave a lot of thought. I don't know if Anna has any idea of her own, but yeah. What is no, it? Actually... Anna? Oh my! <laughs> yeah. your idea, Anna. <laughs> no, I, I haven't. I haven't thought about it actually. I really like the idea about. Yeah. Uh, both family and family of choice as well because uh, in a way is what keeps us together uh, a lot of com minority communities keeps together yeah. nowadays is like this so it's mm -hmm. pretty much yeah, something that I agree yeah. and kind of this feeling that you can be welcomed somewhere uh, be belong to the world this is the feeling that I want to a little toolkit you have, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, about your answer, that's really interesting, the small communities part, like uh, 50 people is like a small group, and everyone has responsibilities, but they all interact with each other. This is really nice. Um, yeah, and I also think about utopias. Another question for you, Nissi. Because when I think about utopias or dystopias, and uh, Again, uh, bringing the second part of my first question, uh, do you think like we can we address, for example, like a dystopia or even an utopia anyway, without discussing climate change, about discussing our connection with our land and our planet? Because I mean, everything that's been going on uh, right now, uh, at least for me, I can think about those subjects without thinking where we are, you know, like a physical space, the land. Can you? Uh, no, I don't actually see how we can do that um, because uh, it's a question of, of um, where do we set the boundaries between ourselves and everything else. And um, some of us have very porous boundaries, I will <laughs> tell you. Um, and some of us have very tight boundaries. And I think that this is a matter of education um, so if, if um, someone with a very porous boundary is, is more likely to accept the fact of, of kinship with uh, a river or a kinship with um, a particular kind of algae or something and therefore not want to cause any harm to that river or that algae, or whatever. Um, whereas someone with a very tight uh, and um, 
well-defined boundary pe between what they call themselves and what um, and everything else, they may not even uh, recognize their whole self as being themselves. Uh, I don't know how well this can come across because I'm not sure that my I can express it well in English, let alone in in uh, translation. But um, people compartmentalize themselves, and so they uh, will disavow, say, their their sexual urges or um, their their urges to um, to to hate someone else or their urge urge to be loved by someone. They may distance what they call themselves from that part of themselves. Um, so that's an extreme. And um, I think it is a function of custom and education that can be worked with. And I think that it's crucial actually to um, make the boundaries between what we call ourselves and everything else more porous, and that helps with, uh, certainly it helps with, with uh, climate change and with our relationship to the natural world. And also just happens to bear on um, what sort of vision we have for a utopia. Yeah, so for, for utopia, your utopia, you think like, you, we should um, address those boundaries? Like. Yes, yes, I do. Um, and um, I think that um, someone who has um, the ability to identify more with uh, things that would not be considered themselves uh, will have a a better time constructing, an easier time constructing and living in a utopia. So um, I'm going to try and uh, give you an example from my childhood. Um, and this will tell you a little bit about how I think. <laughs> so when I was a little girl, I was really puzzled by the saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I don't know if that's, is, is that a familiar saying to you? Yeah, we have an expression close to that. Yeah. yeah, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And I thought, how can that be? Two is greater than one. And if you have a bird in a bush, then you have like the berries and you know. <laughs> yeah, everything else. Yeah, it's great. Um, and it was explained to me that you had to be holding on to the bird and controlling it for it to be yours. And that to me was a profound revelation. I was like, oh, you mean you have to control it to have that close relationship, that identification with it? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that says everything. Oh my God. I, I never, I mean, this is a very used expression in Portuguese as well. We have a, a similar one. But to think about this idea of possession, like you have to control the animal, you have to control uh, the natural resources that you have. They are a separate thing and you have to control them. And yes. this is what we're trying to do all the time. I mean, with every, every single uh, natural resource that we have in hand, like, oh, I need to, okay, let's think about the rubber trees. I need to take down those trees. I need to control this nature so I can have rubber to make cars. Instead of just saying, oh, look, there's a rubber tree. And um, <laughs> it's a part know. of a whole ecosystem. <laughs> it's here yeah. for a reason. And <laughs> oh, well, yeah, then we get into um, the idea of uh, individualism and, and breaking things down to that yeah. level of granularity. Yeah, and if we, if we go, go that road, we're just going to forget about utopias and dystopias anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, actually, I think we can continue. I, was, I thought about, I'm, I'm still wondering about the everything. So it's actually your question, Cynthia. So you want to go? 
about Everfair? Oh yeah, oh yeah, this, oh, I found it here, sorry. <laughs> um, on my script. Okay, so about Everfair, I, if you wanna explain a bit about Everfair, Nisi, because we d still don't have a, a Brazilian edition, that, that would be amazing, but if you wanna explain to the public, because we are talking about Everfair, 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 and people might not be that familiar with your novel, so if you wanna tell them, like I could tell them, but you're here, so please. Please All do. right, so uh, my short version of this, uh, of explaining it, is um, what actually happened in history was that uh, Leopold of Belgium, the second Leopold, uh, decided that he wanted to um, avail himself of the wealth that he saw other rulers availing themselves of. He wanted to to um, be rolling in it, basically. So um, he looked around and he thought that the best uh, way for him to exploit natural resources and extract wealth was to uh, have uh, all control of all of the rubber in, he looked around and he decided the Congo region of central and Western Africa. So uh, he personally, rather than through politics, owned it as far as he was concerned. He bought it and owned it. And um, he brutally exploited the people there by having them harvest it for him as slaves uh, and, and uh, maimed them and killed their families if they did not satisfy his quotas. So that is what really happened. And at least 10 million people died in just a few years under his rule. So my version of what happened, um, I made a slight change. I made the Fabian socialists who again were a historical group of uh, Brits, British people, um, rather than establishing what is now the London School of Economics, they used that money to purchase from Leopold a, a plot of a, a, about half of his land. Because really, what did he want? He wanted money. So give him the money, take the land. Uh, and so they were able to do this with the help of some missionaries, some African descended missionaries that lived in the US. Um, now, sometimes people will say that it was uh, Everfair was a refuge for escaped slaves. And this is true, but not, um, not, they were not escaping slavery and enslavement in the US. They were escaping slavery and enslavement in uh, the Congo region. So, um, the people who came from the U.S. were at least um, officially were freed. Uh, and uh, so there is them from the U.S., uh, there's the European socialists, um, and then there are um, the people who lived in that region. And um, what they did was disappear um, as quickly as they could, you know, hide from from Leopold and his troops. But uh, when the land was bought, um, they reemerged. So we have these these three groups um, forming a new nation uh, and um, trying to live together. And and oh, and also. One of the things that I found out as I was researching this region and this this period in history is that Leopold hired a bunch of Chinese railroad builders um, to to work in in uh, building a, a railroad between the navigable stretches of the Congo River and the uh, port. And um, what what they did was desert. <laughs> they just left. In my version, um, they uh, 
dessert to ever fare. So, so there's a lot of people having a great time and, um, <laughs> and um, you know, putting together uh, airships and that they call air canoes and, and, um, and fighting against uh, Leopold stealing plans for machine guns and winning because of that. This is amazing. <laughs> I really wish if we have any publishing companies in Brazil, like watching our, our event. So please bring <laughs> Everfair to Brazil. Okay, I'm gonna stick to my question, but I, I could like so many topics here, but I'm gonna stick to my question. Um, I, I feel it's really interesting, Nisi, for me that you bring uh, the question of what if uh, to reimagine an historical process over a century ago. So for me, when I start thinking about utopias and dystopias, I, I often think about future. You know, I often think about things that are going to happen and how, uh, how things can be. So why did, you to, why did you choose to reimagine the past instead of the future? That's my question. Well, um, there are a lot of people who will tell you that the past is finished, that it is done, yeah. that it is, um, a, you know, it's it's just cast in stone. I, I don't believe that. Um, I believe that what we understand of the past can definitely change. And also, I think it's really important to do the do the work of reimagining the past to help us reimagine the present and the future. Uh, I don't know how to say it any more elaborately. Um, no, that's very elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, no, sorry, Nisi. No, go ahead. Okay. No, I think I totally agree with that. I think when we try to imagine the past. Well, we are also taking the view of the past in our own hands, right? And this is itself powerful. I think uh, creating images like this make us tell stories, fantasy stories, or even reality through the eyes of groups that weren't able to tell these stories before. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I <laughs> we talked about a uh, issue. Right, and there's a saying about the issue, which is issue killed the bird yesterday with a stone, he only threw today. So, everything is like I feel that there's this magnitude between future, past, and present, and what we do here in the present also matters to the past. In both, right? That's <laughs> I had not heard that saying, that's a beautiful saying, and it uh basically sums up um how what is impossible in uh, in in uh, conventional thinking um, is possible actually with the help of SU. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I like the saying, I'm sorry, I'm really yeah. beautiful. Uh, um, history, oh, you can go back. Uh, yeah, and uh, going, going now also, we were talking about Everfair and you're currently working on your new novel, Kini, right? Yes. Is it? Okay. So it is, it is a continuation to Everfair? It is actually a sequel to Everfair. There are two short stories that I've written that take place uh, in that same setting um, uh, after the events of Everfair. The two short stories are... Um, uh, Sun River, and um, the other one is um, The Colors of Money. Uh, the Colors of Money is in uh, an anthology of ecological fiction, and uh, Sun River is in set in Cairo, so it's in a, a, an anthology called Clockwork Cairo. But Kinning takes place after these ev events also, um, and what's going on is Tink and his sister Bilung are um, working for a an anarchist uh, Chinese movement um, and and going 
on Tink's air canoe across several continents trying to sow revolution. And they're using spores from a fungus. <laughs> Uh, that makes people more empathetic. So um, that's going on. Uh, meanwhile, um, there's when we when we left Everfair, King Wenda was was um, reimposing a monarchy. So there's a, a succession battle between. Uh, two of his children, uh, Princess Mwadi and Prince Ilunga. Um, and once Tink returns to Everfair with his empathic spores uh, that, he's, that he's sowing, uh, this has um, a really profound effect on the uh, succession. I'll just say that. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Uh, we have oh, oh, and about fungus, I mean, I'm thinking about the last of us here. I, I don't know if I have any gamers in the YouTube transmission, but uh, uh, the last of us is a game, a video game, you see, I don't know if you're into that kind of stuff. <laughs> but anyway, but it takes a fungus to think about a dystopia. So it's really, for me, it's like when you said fungus and you bringing this in your next novel for me is like, well, she's using a fungus that I know mostly from a dystopian environment. And it's not the same fungus, of course, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting that you're bringing this and bringing it to, uh, for people to be more empathetic, like in a positive way, not like the, the fungus in the video game, it destroys society. So it's a dystopia and yeah, you're bringing it. There's actually two uh, fungi. Um, one is um, the Russian uh, strain, and then the other is the Chinese. And, um, you know, uh, I started writing this before there was a pandemic, and before people were <laughs> blaming China for this. Um, yeah, my yeah. inspiration was actually uh, something called um, the Wood Wide Web. Uh, there is a fungal. Uh, connection between trees in a forest. Their, their roots are connected by a fungal organism. And so even uh, trees that are of different species will um, trade food, will uh, communicate danger to one another, um, and, and uh, will, will share resources. Um, so that was what I was basing the fungus on, was, was this sort of uh, communication web that is underground in the forest. It's amazing. Well, but the bringing that back in a pandemic, it's a, well, yeah, The yeah. Last of Us was before pandemic, was, it's from 2013, so now it's like, oh, oh, oh damn it. <laughs> yeah. It does have uh, an un unintentionally uh, resonant meaning, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, especially now. Yep, that's kidding. I um. Yeah, no, that, that's. Sorry, Missy. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay, no, <laughs> you're right. I'm I'm especially very excited. With Tini and Everfair, that's why I asked so much also about it. Uh, I think people deserve to know your work here in Brazil. And I came to know actually your work during the workshop writing the other in Clarion West. So for me, it was an amazing experience as a writer, as a person. And I think, uh, so thank you again. And you and Tempest, right? So, and do you think? your project seeks to enlarge representation and furthermore truly make different people care about each other we we're talking about empathy so how, how, how do you do this and with your projects in life if this is a way uh, to seek for an utopia i think um that storytelling can increase people's empathy um it, it's it's pr pretty much one of the few things that actually can since we don't have that fungus that I'm writing about. Um, 
so uh, what it does is um, particularly writing will cause you to formulate these ideas and thoughts inside your own head. And that uh, intimacy <clears throat> of the ideas um, will, will lend itself to you adopting them as your own. I'm talking about actually the mechanism of reading a word you don't, it's not out there as much as um, a film is. I, I believe that this is true also um, in gaming because you are not just thinking, the, <clears throat> sorry, thinking the thing, you're doing the thing. So uh, again, th these are um, tools that build empathy just by their very nature, just by how we use them. Yeah, yeah, and it's amazing what you can do in a matter of narrative uh, with another, other formats as well, with literature, but also other formats like gaming. Uh, it's, it's amazing and how you pra practice empathy. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it can be really kind of sneaky, you know, um, as with uh, the Lord of the Flies, for instance. Um, since I since we talked about it a couple of times, I'm going to type that in into the chat too. Um, I I I really had um, almost a feeling as if I was vomiting when I rejected the idea that uh, that Piggy and and these people were were descending into cannibalism because I had to formulate the idea in my own brain before I could reject it. So if I, if I put together um, a story in which um, people deliberately erode the barriers between themselves and the boundaries between themselves and the natural world, and someone reads it, they will find it harder to reject that idea. This is oh, this is really really amazing. Well, uh, I don't know if I, you want to ask the question first, Anna, or can I ask? No, yeah, you can you can go ahead. Oh, yeah, you want to go? We have sorry. Oh, we have eight eight, eight, eight minutes. Oh, so still have time. Right, my we still have time. <laughs> Yeah, actually, well, following this idea, I think I saw in an interview also with you, and you talked about the importance of bringing the an oppressor into community and to, to end their suppression. So can you tell us more about this idea? And how, I mean, you, you just told us that literature has this power of moving things. And so, what is literature, literature part in this? Well, certainly um, it, that, is, that is an important function of literature um, that, that it, it allows people to um, experiment with uh, the, these different um, viewpoints and um, and to and to, to accept them at least temporarily as their own. Um, one of the the things that I do um, when I'm talk when I'm talking about uh, the one of the things that I I think about when I'm talking about um, bringing an oppressor into the community is getting them to identify with those that they oppress. Um, and and uh, that literature is a great tool for that. They they may need to realize what they're doing. They may need to spend some time um, actually in isolation as well. Uh, have you read my short story, The Water Museum? 
No, not yet. That one, um, I had to speak with uh, a woman who teaches me martial arts because um, what I had set up was a situation where a woman who was uh, in charge of the Great Lakes, um, just a huge uh, natural resource, um, this huge um, ecology of, of fresh water within the continental US. Um, I had her um, pitched against um, an assassin and the assassin what had a gun, you know, he had all these advantages. Um, so I had to ask my um, martial arts instructor how she would handle someone, you know, w with these evil intents. And um, she gave me step-by-step -step instructions what she would do. Uh, and that include, included getting them off balance um, and um, changing the, uh, the scene unexpectedly. So I had them dumped in the water. Uh, and then um, she said, and then I would isolate them for a while. So that might actually be uh, a step between um, perceiving someone's aggression and and uh, integrating them into the community is, is isolating them. Yeah, it's isolating, but bringing them to the community after and like. Yeah, yeah, after, after they've realized, um, after they've spent some time with themselves and maybe they've gotten uh, less fierce about keeping the boundary between different com compartments of their own. Yeah, we hope so, at least. <laughs> <laughs> they, might, they might not, but uh, let's hope so. Yeah. Uh, what are you going to say, Anna? Can say it. No, I love that this idea I now have a manual almost uh, <laughs> that yeah. came out of a story. Seems <laughs> um, sorry. You're going to yeah, ask yeah. a question? Yeah. Yeah, I can ask another question. Um, so, yeah, we're thinking about envision of utopias, dystopias, and boundaries and empathy. And I don't know, possibilities. I imagine other ways of dealing with our world and ourselves and how literature can uh, be a vessel for that, how we can, we can use that as a platform, as a, uh, a way of doing that. So why do you think, Nisi, what, well, why is it for you? And why do you think speculative fiction is such a, a rich uh, literary genre, especially for people of color, I mean, non-white non people, in the sense of why utopias and dystopias and uh, are special, especially important and powerful themes for us. Like, what attracted you in those themes? Like, why why use speculative fiction? Um, because um, other kinds of fiction um, depend on the status quo, and um, speculative fiction does not. It can um, extrapolate from the status quo. Um, it can look at uh, a different path that might be taken to a different status quo. Um, it's it's um, rich with possibilities. So yeah, that's that's why it's important for uh, people of color in particular. We have um, we have one question here that. It's almost like my question, uh, which is many, many dystopians. Well, I'm going to read actually from the public. Miami, it's OK. It's just really similar to my question. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's OK. Um, would the writing of dystopias have a role uh, for you as a possible oracle warning, warning of possible risks that could materialize in a not so distant future? So I am 65 years old and um, I have seen some of these writings come to pass. Um, 
I have been reading science fiction since I was, uh, oh gosh, you know, since I could read really, I, I was reading children's science fiction since I was seven or eight. Um, and uh, some of the um, oracular um, predictions such as uh, reality television, that was a thing in 1960s science fiction, uh, well before it became uh, an actuality. Um, I, I was talking with Nalo Hopkinson the other day and, and she, she mentioned how furious she was because the things that um, had been warned against in this sort of dystopian literature had come to pass as she said, we were talking, we were saying this would happen. Did you not listen to us? Did you not hear? So um, the effectiveness of being an oracle uh, is limited. And um, I, I, I also think that um, it is, when you're in a bad time, when you're having a bad time, when you're in a global pandemic, when you're in, um, you know, uh, horrific circumstances, um, there is something that is truly uh, uh, the spirit of resistance um, in, in uh, writing about things being happy and good and people being nice to one another. That is a real form of resistance. So if people are interested in writing uh, dystopias, I am not here to stop them. But that's not what I want to do. Uh, Thank you. You. Want, you want me to read the next question from the public? Um, so uh, we have just have, uh, we just have thirty minutes left, and we have a questions uh, from the public. But we have time to then I will read the question from the public, and if there isn't another, you can continue, okay? Then, uh, isn't the repetitions of the mantra once utopia is another dystopia, a way for the current system to condition us to not be able to even imagine societies with equity? I suppose it could be. I suppose that they could uh, take that up and, and use it that way. Um, but I um, I think it, of it as more uh, uh, as a caution given by someone who was a writer um, who 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 did actually wrestle with this problem. Um, the the instance that um, Octavia Butler's uh, statement came out of was um, talking about one of her short stories uh, called The Book of Martha. And this is a story in which each person every night is able to create their own utopia. Um, the, the point that you is not made in the story, but that stays with me as a reader, is that um, that was a dystopia for her. That would have been a dystopia. It was a dystopia for Martha, the character, who was an author, and it would have been a dystopia for Octavia as well, because uh, in that sort of scenario, people would not be reading they would not be in uh, doing any, uh, you know, they would not be immersing themselves in, in books, in, in her fiction. So the thing that she was best at, the thing that she enjoyed the most and that she got a lot out of was completely unnecessary. So a utopia for everyone else, not a utopia for Octavia or for her character, Martha. Um, but that didn't stop her from doing it. 
I think consider the source. True, and, and this story is also, we come back to the, the thing that is, everyone will dream about their own utopia and have no other connection with each other. Yeah, she discussed that in the, in the short story yeah. room. Like this is this is a problem now because people will be just dreaming in their own heads, and they're not gonna live reality. They're gonna live their dreams. So how do we fix that? It's a really good short story. Yes, yes. Octavia, I, Octavia Butler, right? All, all Octavia, all the time. <laughs> all Octavia, all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, everyone in this table is really Octavia's mother. Yeah, everyone here is her fan. <laughs> and, and actually, is I since you've mentioned her, uh, can you actually tell a little, a little more about how Utopia and Dystopia work in other Utopia, Octavia Butler's works? Uh, her works have been recently translated and published here in Brazil, actually. And so everyone I think is beginning to be familiar with her works. So, and I know you also translated, no, sorry, organized uh, Blood Children, right? With her scholars. Oh, yes. Um, those were the people who received the Octavia Butler scholarship. Um, so they are all science fiction authors. Um, and I, I wanted to make sure that, that their voices were heard. So yeah, I organized and edited that. Um, I think um, just from what I knew of her and from what, what I know of her writing, Octavia really wanted to be a utopian writer and could not. <laughs> um, she, she, she was really, um, she thought that she would make uh, more of an impression on people by writing what she called yes books, uh, books where, where there were happy endings, where there were good feelings, where things worked out. And she kept coming up with uh, what she would call no books, um, kindred, um, I would say um, the Patternist books, uh, Wild Seed uh, and um, Mind of My Mind and, and those sorts of things, because um, she had this idea that human nature was flawed, intrinsically f flawed. I'm happy to say I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she really tried, and, and then she wrote like the duology parables, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which by which, by the way, she wanted to get to the point where um, there would be an, at least a, a third, possibly a fourth, and a fifth novel set in more utopic uh, circumstances. Um, she wanted to write about the colony that would be formed by the people who left in. Uh, parable of the talents um, and she she had really a hard time doing that <clears throat> the closest she came I think to uh, writing a utopian uh, society was uh, in her last book fledgling which was a vampire book uh, and with in which uh, the venom of these um, biologically superior beings that that we would call vampires creates communities um, in which everyone is happy, but they're happy because they're um, drugged on her venom, so. Yeah, well, I have a question. I don't know, can I ask? Or... Um, oh, no. uh, okay. We have a, another question uh, from the public, then I will give the opportunity. <laughs> for say it. Uh, why when reading dystopia right at the beginning we get a deep sense of silence of humanity as well as of past and future a note the wording is confusing the original so i'm sorry hmm. get a deep sense of silence of humanity 
Um, maybe the absence of humanity is that is that closer to the meaning of that? Um, because um, all right, there is a book. Let's see if I can find it on my shelf. Here it is. I'll be right back. Okay, so there is a book that I'm going to uh, type the name of into this chat. It's called A Paradise Built in Hell. It's by a woman named Rebecca Solnit. It is nonfiction. And what Rebecca Solnit does is write about communities that form in the wakes of disasters, in the wake of Katrina, in the wake of uh, an earthquake. Um, uh, and, and she talks about how people work together, how they take care of each other, how they, um, how they are humane to one another. Um, how they are caring and loving to strangers. And um, that is why the, the book is called A Paradise Built in Hell, because it is, the, the surroundings are horrible. People are dying, there's death, there's plague, whatever. Um, but people are, um, in my opinion, revealing their true, human natures by taking care of one another. Um, so this is what I actually think um, is, is going on. Uh, um, not necessarily in the written dystopia, but in the uh, approximations that we see of it around us. Uh, another way to put this, um, in the US uh, and in, Anglophone culture, we talk about uh, the response to calamities being um, to, to um, let's see, what is it? They say something that rhymes, um, fight or flight, <clears throat> fight or flight. Um, and there is also um, a tendency to do things uh, another way that I think is also at least as strong in humans, and that is called to tend and befriend. So you'll see people who believe that um, our basic human urges are fight or flight, that uh, when we're cornered, we um, hurt one another or we run away. And then there are people who believe that when things get bad, we tend and befriend, we take care of one another and make friends with one another. And that's what uh, A Paradise Built in Hell is about, is uh, all the examples that uh, come to light over and over again of people tending and be befriending. And that's what I think um, people who, who um, are doing these dystopian uh, novels and short stories, um, they, they, um, they, they're buying into the fight or flight model of, of human behavior. That's why you um, get this absence of humanity and, um, and, it, and it's also bereft of any examples in, of uh, past behavior because they are not existent. Yeah, and I think I, I agree with you a lot because but yeah, I think too. it's actually really hard to think about being there for each other uh, in dystopians or, but I'm really big fan of bell hooks and and i think also a lot about love and how can we build like a 
uh, communities and be there for each other. So although we are in this crazy situation till now, <laughs> and uh, I think that actually gives me strength to continue. I, although I really love reading the token stories. I and token yeah. Stories and yeah, I'm, I'm more of a dystopian. I mean, I don't know. So I used to, before pandemic, I was more into dystopias than I thought they were more uh, realistic than utopias. Like the, I, I feel like I felt like we were, it, it was more probable that we would live a dystopia than an utopia. Um, but right now, like seeing everything that well, after a year and I, I tend to agree with you, Nisi, and I tend to, to agree that we can, I really want to read A Paradise Built in Hell. It's really interesting. And yeah, that we can like lift each other up, you know, we can actually help each other and be, I don't know, have more empathy with each other. And I, I don't know, I try, I'm trying, I, be, I became a more positive person right now. So I, I tend to believe more in, or to work more towards utopias than dystopia now. I don't know why. Well, it's just a relief. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, we don't have any questions, so I'm going to ask my question. Can I? Yes, you can do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. Um, do you, one, first, Nancy, do you plan to organize um, other anthologies? Because um, I was thinking when I thought about this question, uh, I was thinking about the movie Black Panther from 2018, and it was a massive commercial success. And I got so happy when it came out, and it was amazing. And introduced to a whole new generation. I mean, I knew Marvel before, and I knew about the comics and the things like that. Mm. But it introduced the, the concept of utopia, because Wakanda is an utopia in several ways, or could be read that way. Uh, but to introduce it to a whole generation that might not be so uh, keen with the comics and with the concept of Utopia. So uh, to introduce to this new generation a really commercial way, uh, like you, you can think about other futures, you can think about other possible futures and historical process because Wakanda, like they, they have technology and they've been through a uh, whole historical process until you arrive in the 21st century. So it's, an, it's a what if. Um, so what is the importance of expanding like speculative fiction, not just beyond the subgenres, uh, but even formats like Wakanda started in the comics, but it became a movie. Uh, why, how can we expand more uh, speculative fiction to people and how to do that? Oh, well, I, I'm not sure. I'm involved in at least three anthologies <laughs> that are coming out right now. That's so nice. one of them is a very uh, small anthology of only like six or seven stories uh, coming out from Amazon or original stories. It's uh, called Black Stars. And so far we have uh, stories from Nnedi Okorafor, Nalo Hopkinson, uh, Victor Laval and um, C.T. Ruisi, and we're still uh, working on on uh, stories from um, Roxane Gay and um, Chimamanda Adichie. So, um, oh, and and I have a story in there. <laughs> I, sh I should mention that based on a Jimi Hendrix song. Oh, that's amazing! Which song? Um, 1983, A Merman I Should Turn to Be. Oh, that's amazing. I love Jim Hendrix. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, so there's that one. And then um, uh, the people who published New Sons want me to do a New Sons 2. Um, so uh, I've g given them a theme this time. Um, I've invited people, um, more people than I will be able to include, to write about um binaries <laughs> Ooh, nice um, let's see um, and then um the woman who is octavia butler's uh literary executor Marilee heifetz 
she and I are planning to do a new uh, Blood Children anthology because there have been more people that got the Octavia Butler scholarship. So, you know, more stories. Mm -hmm. I hope that'll help. <laughs> yeah. More anthologies, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, but we have our last questions from the public. Then, do you have any connections or research related to Native American people to write about? Um, I don't have any um, things I, in particular I'm thinking of writing about in in connection with uh, Native American people, I do have, I, I've studied my own genealogy and I have found uh, that there were some people uh, in my ancestry who were Indians. Um, and I also um, am a big, big fan of a woman named Grace Dillon, um, she, who, I sometimes call her the great Grace Dillon. Uh, I'm typing her name in here. Uh, and she has edited uh, a couple of anthologies that I find really moving and really, oh, um, really enlightening. Um, I think um, I need to check, uh, let me see. Um, was it Walking the Clouds? Was that her anthology? I'll check on my uh, search engine here. Walking the Clouds, yeah, that's it. Um, so Grace Dillon, Walking the Clouds. Um, and uh, she, uh, talks quite a bit about indigenous futurism. Um, she's involved in um, judging films and literary uh, attempts, uh, lit stories, um, and and giving out prizes for those. That's as close as I come. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Nisi. Uh, I'm sorry, but we just some minutes to finish this panel. Then I will ask you for yourselves, say the final remarks. If you have any book launch announcements, website, website, and social media invites, can you say now? And if you have some last comments, now is the time, okay? <laughs> okay. Oh, let's see. Well, let's see. <clears throat> I'm on Twitter, um, and it's pretty easy to find me. There, there's, uh, I'm at Nisi Shawl. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, not because I think that Facebook is that great, but because um, it's where all the old people hang out. And um, and I'm an old, and so there I am with you know my dad and and all my relatives. <clears throat> um, things that are coming out. Uh, well, uh, there is an anthology called uh, Sword Stone Table, um, edited by Jen. Northington and Swapna Krishna. And so that is um, an anthology whose theme is um, messing around with uh, changing up Arthurian myths, you know, uh, King Arthur, Merlin, all those. So I have a story coming out in that, which also has something to do with um, the fungal under forest, the wood wide web. Um, in my story, um, which is called I Being Young and Foolish, um, I have an albino magician coming from the Lake Victoria region 
of Uganda and, and uh, traveling to Wales and studying under Merlin. Um, <laughs> uh, so she's a, she's a lady of the lake. She's it just, it's just Lake Victoria. Um, and so, um, and, and she teaches him a few things about getting along with fungus. <laughs> Uh, I have a story that's up right now um, called Fourth and Most Important. And that one is, let's see, that is part of a series that I've, I've done about a, gosh, how would you say this? It's a fake social movement. Um, I had a dream about a social movement uh, called the uh, Five Petals of Thought. <laughs> and um, this is a story from, from, uh, from that social movement, which, you know, I, I had to go look on Wikipedia actually, because I thought it really existed. Um, so that one is called Fourth and Most, Most Important. And that's available on the web right now at the website of Arizona State University. I think, Nisi, well, everyone's thinking right now is, Nisi, you have to bring your work to Brazil. So publishing companies in Brazil, if you're listening to this conversation, bring Nisi to Brazil. <laughs> we need to read those stories in Portuguese so we can like spread all over the world, all over Brazil. Uh, in Portuguese, so we would love to have your work uh, translated. So if anyone wants to translate, <laughs> Nisi, please. That would be amazing. Um, my final remarks are, thank you so much for this conversation, Nisi. It was amazing. I'm looking forward to read all of your new stories. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I don't have anything coming out anytime soon, guys, but if you want to follow me on social media, uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, so uh, that's it. And I'm really honored. Thank you, Nisi. Thank you, uh, Mayara. Thank you, Anna. And I hope we can uh, meet each other soon, face-to-face, uh, -face, maybe one day, uh, <laughs> but virtually and in other events. So thank you so much. Yeah, so thank you. Also, be very fast. Thank you, Nisi, so much. Thank you, Cynthia, Mayara. It was a really pleasure to be here today. Uh, yeah, I agree with Cynthia also. Uh, I'm also, uh, I'm really eager to translate the, the translations. Um, well, if you guys uh, want to see more what, what I'm doing, I have a website called, I'm gonna say it in Portuguese, okay? Escritoranameira.com.br uh, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you again. And as a published uh, published poet, published writer, talk about the stories of, in your, the anthologies, Anna. Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna be my friend. Yeah. Talk Thank you. Talk about your work, Anna. So um, thank you. I'm so emotional today. Uh, first, I want to thank you, our ancestor here. Uh, I know it was so uh, emotional listening Nisi talk about her uh, then ancestor Anna and Cynthia, and I don't know. I'm wearing uh, earring with the mirror of uh, Oshun Orisa. This mm. is my way of honor this Orisha all the time. And it's beautiful, listen yourselves and think about the different kind of ways that you have to honor our ancestors here. Then, so thank you everybody for being here today. I learned so much. I'm very grateful, grateful for this conversation. Thank you. And so I need to finish this video. <laughs> Subscribe to our channel, support Helen Payo, Pix and PayPal. Link in the video descriptions. Our next panel today will be Dissident Bodies in Science Fiction with Cheryl Morgan. 
And check, check it out the full program at helenpayo.com.br e nas nossas redes sociais. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Sim. <laughs>